Okay, everybody ready? Today we're going to cover um, more advanced uses of texture maps. And you'll notice what I've done is I've built just a simple cube, and that's it, using primitives. But notice on this side, it looks like the side of the cube is made of wood, and I have a window inserted there. And you'll notice that the window frame is slightly raised, so it looks separate. You'll also notice that the panes in the window are transparent. You can see the little ball that I have in there, or big ball that I have in there. You'll also notice that the, um, the, the, the glass looks, it's exaggerated, but it looks slightly ripply, like old glass, you know, that has slightly waves in it. And it's slightly reflective. So I've added all these features. I've added transparency, I've added bumps, I've added a, a texture, all to one surface. And none of the geometry has been changed on the cube. It's just a simple cube with six polygons, and that's it. It's all done with surfaces, changing the surfaces. And this, if you can start to think like this, will really take you a long, long way, because then you can build just simple geometry and work on the two-dimensional textures in various ways of projecting them onto the surface and creating some incredibly complex models with very basic geometry. <coughs> if I can find the video, I know we have one. It's on the making of mist. Does everybody know what mist is? No? It's one of the first really incredible video games, or not, see, it was on a CD, what I say, video games, it was a, a CD games. And today it looks dated, but if you look at um, <coughs> Riven, um, really incredible models, and just incredible models. And the, it, the, we do have a, a CD with the making of mist on it in, in Riven. And you'll see the wireframes, and they look pretty basic. But when you look at the rich, rich textures and the, that they've layered on there, I mean, the look of rocks and the look of glass and all kinds of rich woods and stuff, it's just really incredible. Now, I had that in my office. I don't know where it is anymore. It's actually Chris's, so we'll see. So this is what the final piece is going to look like. So what we have to do is we have to start in, in Photoshop, and that's where I am at the moment. So I'm going to hide this temporarily, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, what you will see here <coughs> is a simple square piece with a window frame in here, this flat two-dimensional. Does everybody see what I've done? You can, what I have done in here, if you look at layers, <coughs> is that I have built each of these um, parts on using the shape layers, which are down here. Um, if you look at this, how familiar are you with Photoshop? A little bit? Okay. Well, we have the option in Photoshop. I mean, you can, uh, this could be a photograph of a window. It doesn't have to be one that you've generated in here, but when I'm done with it, you'll see that you will have to make, learn to make selections <coughs> and save the selections on separate channels so that you create what are called stencils, or which turn out to be like cookie cutters. And what they do when we're in modeler or layout and we create these complex surfaces is it allows you to allow some of the image to be projected through and it prevents some of the image from being projected through. So they're basically stencils is what they are. But we start with the overall image and we have an overall image of a window. So we have the window frame and we have the window panes. And each of these panes, for example, are separate from one another. We can look in here, if I select this one, let's move it. You can see how they're all separate elements in here. And you can see how the frame behind it is actually a separate element on a separate layer. Now, what I have also done <coughs> is that you'll see in parts is that I have broken it down into little stencils everywhere that I want 
to be able to control the surface, the projection of the surface, I have to create a separate little cookie cutter or a separate stencil. So let's, let's start with general and go to specific so you understand what I mean. <coughs> start with the overall size of the file. Because maps are basically square, not basically they are, it's best if you start with maybe a 512 by 512 pixel um, image. And LightWave has the ability to use high resolution images. So this can be a 300 pixel or 300 DPI or 300 PPI <coughs> image. So if we look under image size, you'll see it's 512 by 512, very small image, but 300 pixels per inch. When I bring the surface in, it brings in the whole thing, background as well, meaning this area outside of the window. Does that make sense? This is all part of my surface, not just the window. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. This entire area is the surface. So what I want to be able to do, for example, when we were looking at this, is I want to be able to control it. I don't want the white out here, because that's what it will do. As soon as I use this as a projection map, it will project the window, and it will also project the white around it. I don't want to see the white. I want to be able to reserve that for something else. So it becomes, you use um, different images now as stencils, as cookie cutters that allow only parts of the image to be projected to show through. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to mask the window, just the whole silhouette of the window to allow it to come through and to hide the rest of this. Or mask the background as it will to allow just the window to show through. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me set this aside. <coughs> And that's what I have here on one of these. If I turn this on, that's what this is going to do. Because all of the masks that we create, the texture masks, are going to be black, white, or shades of gray. So by using layers in Photoshop, it enables me to make sure that each of these are perfectly registered on top of one another so that they fit and the mask is a perfect fit and also that they're the exactly the same size or the size that I need. Does that also make sense? Okay. So now what you'll see, and I can flip the foreground with the background, I can invert it in LightWave so it doesn't matter which I use. But now what I can do is I can utilize the black area as a whole. That's going to be my stencil that will allow the frame to show through and it will mask the rest of this. If I didn't use this, what would happen is, as I said, the whole window would be projected, including the white background area. Now I could in here, in Photoshop, I could include the wood surface around the background and I could just project the whole thing and that would work too. Um, I prefer separating them. So that you, later on, what if you decide, you know what, I don't want wood anymore. I want it to look like stucco, or I want it to look like a different kind of wood, or I want to do whatever. Well, by keeping it in the separate components, you know, breaking it down into, into basic elements, I can go back in and I can change it, I think, much more easily. So that's one element. So what I'm doing now is I have my overall... <clears throat> Let's turn this back off. I have my overall picture frame, or my picture frame, my overall window with the panes and the frame and everything. That's what I want to project. And you'll see that it's that light yellow color. And glass actually does have a bit of a color. Um, typically, glass is either kind of a, a greenish color or bluish color. Sometimes old glass can be um, bluish color or a, a really deep violet blue. Um, it can also be a smoky gray. Glass is never totally clear. It always has a slight tint to it somehow, and it looks a little bit more believable when you do have a slight tint. So that's why I've made that a light, light blue. Now the next thing that I want to be able to isolate is the frame itself, because you'll notice that the frame here is raised from everything else. It looks 
independent. It has a raised surface so that I will make a bump map from this particular image. And that bump map will take the surface normals in just this area and it will push it. And I can either make it inset or I can project it outwards. It doesn't make any difference. And then the last thing that I need to do, but let me go ahead and show you how this is isolated. If I turn this on and I turn, can't remember myself which one is which. That's okay. So I have that. Oh, come on, Kurt. I don't need that one. Do I need that one? I'm not come out wherever you are. I guess I had, well, I had that. And then I had, let's turn that on. There we go. So here, um, by turning layers on and off, and obviously I'm, struggling with this a little bit because it's just, you know, you have to remember which ones do you turn on, which ones you do you turn off. But again, they're all based on the original size, so that works. So now you'll see I have a black cookie cutter cut out for just the window frame that I will be able to use for a bump map for my frame, window frame. Likewise, if I turn it off, turn this off and turn, yeah, okay, leave that one on, turn, which one do I need to turn off? turn these off. There we go. So now I just have a map that I will save as an independent file. All these will be saved as independent files, by the way. Separate files. So, so this one now will be a map that I will use just for the window panes that I will use for, in, for two ways. I will use it for a transparent map so that I will turn this part of the map into a, tra you know, make it transparent so that you can see through it. And the second thing that I will do to get this bumpy kind of glass surface, because no glass is absolutely smooth, <coughs> um, you get large panes of glass, even new glass that you see on the side of a building, and it'll slightly warp and woof. You know, I mean, there'll be slight bends in it. And you'll see that when you look up at office buildings and stuff, it's never perfect. It sort of distorts um, whatever is reflected in it a little bit. And I've exaggerated it intentionally. So I will use this for two purposes. One will be, as I said, the bump map. The other will be for the transparent map. And each one has to be saved separately. What you do need to do is create a copy of this file and turn it to grayscale because the bump maps can only be in grayscale. They will not work in color. The projection map that I'm using for the window itself, the original one, this one and this one, and turn this one off, can be color. It has to be RGB, CMYK will not work. And in all instances, you want to save them <coughs> as TGA files. That's a safe one. Those are Targa files, which will, can be opened in um, LightWave. Sometimes it opens JPEG, sometimes it opens others, you know, but it's kind of iffy. So does that make sense, what I've done here? The, um, the color part can be 24-bit. The grayscale can only be 8-bit. Okay, so 256 levels of gray. And with color, 24-bit, it can be millions of colors. But for your bump maps, your transparent maps, any of your texture maps that we're going to apply, <coughs> they need to be grayscale. So what I've done is I've created all of these separate files, and you can see here they are separate. They're all TGA files. There's my window pane. There's another one. There's my another window. There's the overall window silhouette. There's the window frame, and I've named them accordingly so that they all look, you know, and and read pretty clearly. So now I'm going to go ahead and hide these just to keep them open for the heck of it for the time being, and I'm going to go back over to. <coughs> let's close this. Let's go to modeling. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and open the model. So go ahead and file. I've already created the, the object, so I'm going to go ahead and load object. <coughs> and I have it saved on my desktop at the moment. So I'll go to here. And it's not in my content folder, which is where it should be. Here's my window demo. Here are my objects, and I have my building with window. I'm going to go ahead and open it, and it says file not found. 
cannot find the images. And the reason it can't find it is because the content directory is selected for the hard drive on the computer, not this one. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Go back to the desktop. Go back to the folder again that I have for this window demo. It's looking for window TGA. I go back to images and I go into window and I find my window TGA. And as soon as I open this one, it should find all the rest. Can't find what else? Content. Photo River. Yep. Um, river I used and I forgot to copy it. I'm using that as a reflection map for the window panes. Does that make sense? I have something with a nice blue sky, clouds, stuff like that, that will be used to reflect inside the window panes. So unfortunately, I didn't make a copy of this, so I need to go back to my hard drive, go into Applications. Let's look in Lightwave 8. We're going to look in Content. We're going to look in Classic Content. I'm going to look under Images. Scroll down, and where the heck is it? Um, it's not reflection, it's photos. River TGA, River TGA. So I found it. That's it. So that's that works nicely to be reflect, reflected in the windows. It could be anything, though. I mean, you could have a person reflected in the window. It doesn't matter. I have the moon reflected. And here's my model. As I said, it was just a very simple, basic cube. Now, what I did, because if you're not careful, if I, by, not selecti by not selecting anything, remember, it will apply the surface to everything. And I only wanted the surface to be applied to this one polygon. So, by selecting polygons, and I select this one, it was just applied to it. So let's go ahead and look at the surface editor. <coughs> and you'll see that I just have a couple of, uh, actually three different surfaces that I've generated for this. One was for the ball inside the room to show you that it was transparent. You could see inside it. <coughs> the other one is for the building itself, which was just for the box, just the generic brown. And this is where the complex part is. This is the window. So let's look at this and deconstruct it like we did before with the textures that we looked at yesterday. But the textures that we looked at yesterday, remember, I said were procedurals. These are all image maps that we're using. They're, they're Photoshop images that were saved as TGA files that we're projecting onto the surface. And remember, there's different ways of projecting them, and they have generic ways. Planar, they have cylindrical, they have spherical, they have cube, and ones that we haven't gotten to yet would be UV, and we can also have, um, oh shoot, what's the one for the camera? Uh, well, let's go ahead and click here and see what we have here. Um, if we look under, we have planar, cylindrical, spherical, cubic, front view, as well as UV front view means that it's projected from the camera onto the surface. And that can be pretty nifty for some things. It's one way that if you want to add animation, or let's say, let's do it, let's think of it this way. Let's say you had built a television set and you wanted to have something actually playing on the television when they saw it. You know, it could be a rerun of a Bible of Lucy or something that you have, and you were able to save that as a quick time movie, a little snippet of it. Well, what you would able to be able to do is, like the screen that we created for Mike, you could use a front projection on that, and then you would be able to, as your image map, to project on there the quick time movie of Bible of Lucy, so that as you render it, now, if you render it as a still, it just renders a still. But if you rendered it as a movie, even though the, your, your object would not be moving around, it would play the video inside it that was projected onto it. So that's what this, this is one thing that it's very useful for. Well, this box is simply a planar surface. And I want you to look over here of all, to all the layers that I have in here. So let's turn them off. So you can see what I have here. 
<coughs> I'm just going to start with the window itself. Window, window, window. Okay, let's look at this one here. At the very base of everything is my basic window, and that's what you see here. And remember what I said is that it projects not only the window, but the area around it. Does that make sense? It, that white area around it, it projects that as well. Well, I don't want to see that white area. So what I need to do on a layer on top of it, and that's what I've done in here, is I turned on that window silhouette. That's this one right here. It was the one that I created in grayscale that the overall size of the, the window itself is selected. And you'll notice that, that I have invert layers selected. If I don't see that it actually will, it doesn't protect that back area anymore. Notice up here in the preview. So that's why I said it doesn't matter which is black and which is white because you can always invert them. <coughs> now, another thing to note in the basic layer, the one with the window, the, the picture of the window on it. Oh, let me go back to here again. There we go. Okay, let's turn this off. Let's go back down here. Okay, so on the basic layer, you'll notice here under blending mode, this is very important. This one is a normal layer. It's just a normal projection, the same way that we projected the face of Mike onto the monitor. And that we use auto scale, and maybe you moved it up or down a little bit to make it fit. And we also reset it so that it, would, it um, wouldn't tile. But um, in, in this particular instance, I'm creating a single window on the side of a box. But what if we were creating a skyscraper and you had hundreds of windows and they were all equidistant, you know, all evenly spaced? In that case, you would want to use repeat. Then you'd only have to create one window and on it would automatically tile and it re would repeat across the whole thing. So there's no need when you're building something like a skyscraper to cut out all the individual win windows, you know, either remove polygons or use Boolean modeling or something like that to, to change the geometry of it, it's totally unnecessary. You just make a, a box and that's it. And by using this projection map, we can use a repetition of a single window, a single pane, and create all of the windows on one side. Okay, so this is normal. But in order to get this to become a cookie cutter, what we need to do is turn the blending mode into alpha. What alpha does for our purposes, and this is I don't use that, so use Photoshop quite a bit in the same types of blending mode. It can be additive, subtractive, difference, multiply, and divide. Okay, very similar. So that you can start to um, interleave, as it were, or combine layers between one another. And that's what we're doing. What the alpha does is that it doesn't see this as an image now. It turns, <coughs> by inverting it, it turns the black into an opaque area and it makes the white transparent. Now, I can re never remember which is which because in some programs it does just the opposite. So I look here in my preview up here and when I select invert, if I see the white background, I know, okay, that's not what I wanted. I want to mask the white background, so if I click invert, now I see, excuse me, the, the brown showing through. <coughs> now, instead of brown here, like I've used in the remainder of this, I want a wood texture, right? So now I've added the texture of wood, and that's what this is on top of it. So I've used a wood JPEG and lucked out that wood JPEG works. It doesn't have to be a TGA file. And in the wood JPEG, I've controlled, I mean, I've left it in the default setting, but what if I want the planks in that wood to be narrower, or I want it to look like it's made of one piece of wood or whatever, I can control the scale of that here and the position of that down here. Yeah. It's just a simple photograph, and that's it. Um, for example, let's just go back and look at it. Let me go back to Photoshop. Let's 
go back to file open and you'll see the picture of it. In fact, this is available under classic content, under woods in um, uh, you know, images in Lightwave 8. Um, let me go back on the desktop because that's where I saved it. And I'm going to look under window demo and images. And here I have, here's my wood JPEG, so I'll open that up. That's all that is, is a picture of wood. But you remember the other day when we were looking at all the cubes and they had wood as a procedural, but that <coughs> procedural maps don't make wood look very real. It looks pretty artificial. If you have to use wood as a procedural, it's not bad if you plan on animating it for whatever reason because all of these maps can be animated. <coughs> You'll notice to the right, when we're back over here, <coughs> zoom when I'm over here, that we have a T and an E. Okay, T stands for texture, E stands for envelope. And because we're not animating in this class, we really don't need to use it, but if we wanted to animate the textures, if you want, if you were creating, for example, <coughs> a cop car or something, and it had this flashing light on top of it that was changing, or, or maybe, or maybe it was a, a lighthouse and that light was spinning around or something like that, and you wanted to create that look that it was spinning, or that it was flashing on and off like a cop car light or something like that. Well, you can animate that. <coughs> You can have it change colors, you can have it rotate, you can have it do all sorts of stuff. So that's what the envelope does. It allows you to animate the texture. And procedurals are, are, are easier to animate, or they will, there's a lot of interesting things that you can do with procedurals to animate them. And that's why that would be useful. But if for whatever reason you wanted the grain to be changing over time or something like that, a procedure would be the way to do it, not using a projection map the way we're doing, the way that we're doing. But that's way more advanced, and that also requires that we animate everything. So that's what I've got. I've just projected a piece of wood. Now this can be a photograph of wood, or you can bring an actual piece of wood in. Scan, put it on the scanner and scan it, but what you have to remember when you're done is that it has to be in a square format because that square format, you can stretch it, compress it, do whatever you want, but it, ultimately it has to be able to tile to fit across an entire surface if, if necessary. <coughs> so that's what we're doing. So what I've done is I've selected, <coughs> what I want to do now is I have my window projected. I also am projecting the wood on there. But if I turn all these, the rest of these off, what this should be doing, I mean, I have these other maps that would be turned off. Notice here, you don't see the window anymore. It's just another, it, it could be a box that looks like it's made out of wood. So what I'm doing, similar to what I did with the window, I'm doing with the wood now, is that I have, let's, well, let's turn all these off so I can turn this one on. I'm using, the same silhouette again, but notice that I don't have invert selected. I'm using this two different ways. This, what I'm doing now is that I, I am creating a, a cookie cutter and I'm allowing the outside of the area of that map to be projected and I'm hiding the window part. Does that make sense? So when you stack all of these on top of one another, I'm allowing two projection maps to go through. The picture of the image of the window and the image of the wood. And what these <coughs> alpha or these alpha channels do with these other images is they enable us to allow only certain parts of that image to be projected through. Does that make sense? It's the same principle in Photoshop when you're using masking techniques. When you use layer masks that allow parts of images to show through and they hide others, it is the same principle. So that if you have taken a Photoshop class or you're taking a Photoshop class, that's exactly what we're doing in here. So you can create with multiple images some very complex, extremely complex projection maps now. So this is, this is just the window. This is just a picture of it. I haven't covered the bumps, the transparencies yet. Okay, so that was just this. This is our color map. 
Now let's go down here and let's work on, before we work on reflection, let's work on transparency. To look on the projection here, the only thing that I wanted to be transparent were the window panes, correct? What, so I clicked on here, texture map, <coughs> and you'll notice down here the scale is the same. It has to be the same for all of these. If it isn't, it would be the same as taking a stencil. The same kind of stencils that they use to spray paint numbers on the side of your cur the curb in front of your house. It's the same principle. It masks some areas and it allows some area to be sprayed. That's exactly what we're doing. And you're stacking those on top of one another, one by one, allowing certain things to show through and hiding others. Well, for the transparent map, what I'm doing here, and I made the layer opacity 80.5%. So it's not totally transparent. It's just, and it's a normal layer in here, is that I'm using that image that I created of the window panes. So, and I, again, I had to invert it, because if I do that, it's going to make everything else transparent and the window panes opaque. How do I know that? Is because when I click back and forth, you see what's going on here? If I were to put under options, if I were to put checkerboard behind it, see how it's making everything transparent but the window pane? And then when I turn invert back on, it's making everything opaque except for the, the window pane. So if you forget whether white is, tr is going to be transparent or black, just toggle back and forth and you'll get a pretty good idea. <coughs> now, you also have to determine the, the axis and it will be the same as all the others. You have to determine the scale and position and it will be the same as all the others. We can copy and paste these layers from one, on, from one to another to make sure that the scale is the same, to make sure that the position is the same because if you decide later on that I want to move this window in the upper left hand corner, I can do that. It's not permanently fixed, but if I move one of these, I have to move all of them so all of those are repositioned and they all match. So, transparent map. What that does is it makes the window panes transparent. I also have a bump map. <coughs> down here it makes surfaces bumpy I have I've used this in two separate instances now when we look at <coughs> the surface and let's look at let's go back to Photoshop for a minute <coughs> and we're gonna look at this guy the window frame is projected in front it looks like it's raised from the wood doesn't it it casts a shadow, we have a light side, we have a shadow side. Actually, it looks like it's raised from the panes. And I have not changed the geometry of that cube at all. It's all done with the map that I've created. Likewise, the window panes look slightly ripply. And again, I have not changed the geometry of that at all. I've applied a bump map. And similar to using a cookie cutter, to allow different bumps, and I use procedurals in this particular case um, for the window pane, but not for the window frame or the window frame, um, to allow certain parts to be bumped and other parts just to remain flat. So, how did I do that? Let's go back again. Let's look under the bump. Okay, I have. Let's turn these off. And I have the window frame. So this is the frame that I created in Photoshop. It was based, you know, generated from the other images, saved as a separate image, just black and white, grayscale, 8-bit, TGA, or JPEG if it works. Okay, now notice that I changed the amplitude to 4, so it's really raising it. What I could also do is if I inverted the layer, it would look like it was recessed. It would not look like it was cut out. You know, it was projecting from it. It would look like it was pushed in. So bump maps work both ways. It looks like it's actually raised from the surface or inset into the surface. 
So that's what I used for the window frame. Now, what did I use for the window panes? Because I only want the window panes to have this turbulence in here. I use turbulence, I don't know why, it seemed to work okay. Um, I usually use, what do I use? Um, crumple works, no. Turbulence does work, I was thinking crumple. Turbulence works just fine to make it ripply. So I've used um, the procedural of turbulence and it takes the lights and darks from this. Again, either lights are raised and darks recede. And I only want it applied to the window panes. So what I need to do, we have that for our turbulence, but notice that everything is bumpy. You see how in the, without this other layer added, see how everything looks bumpy and crippled and um, rippled. If I were to change to crumple, let's switch to crumple. See how everything looks crumply? But as soon as I turn on the layer on top of it, there's an alpha channel. It smooths all of that out and it only makes the window panes crumply. So what it's doing is it's protecting everything else except the window pane areas so that they are just the ones that will receive the bump from that. Now, I've applied two different kinds of bump maps within here. You could have 10, 20, 30, 50, it depends on what you're doing. <coughs> and not only can we use bump maps in here, let me go back to, what was I doing? Let's go back to here. I don't, I'm gonna go back instead of crumple I said I used turbulence, didn't I? Okay, I'll just leave that and I hope the settings are remaining the same. That I didn't screw it up. Um, the last one that I applied is that I wanted a reflection map. I don't want everything to have reflective properties. I only wanted the glass to have reflective properties. But again, if there were several elements, separate elements that had different reflective properties, just like different bump properties in here, I had the window frame that had a bump property and I had the window panes that had a bump property, but they were different. Well, likewise here, everything here is a matte surface. If I wanted things to be shiny, I could, but in this case, the wood is matte, the frame is matte, the only thing that has reflective properties is the glass. So once again, I use that same image that I've used for the other panes for transparency, and I use for bumps. <coughs> I'm using it as a reflection map so that when I apply reflectivity to it, okay, so here's window panes. And here's the transparency, the same image. I'm using this as, a, as my reflective property. I'm using this one, exactly the same image, um, to control how much um, reflectivity that it has. And I hope, I, again, I hope I haven't screwed things up because it takes time to tweak these and to adjust the opacity and things like that to make sure that everything works the way you'd hope. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and send the object. I'm sure all of you were thoroughly confused, right? Well, it get, it bre if you break it down into the basic parts, you, mean you have to be analytical about it, that's for sure. <coughs> um, then it begins to make sense. And if you do have experience with Photoshop and you're thinking uh, about working in layers and about working with layer masks, it will make a lot of sense. And this with your toy, for example, what if you want to apply text to the side of your toy, like a decal? Okay, right now you could use the Boolean function. You could project it onto there and you could create that stencil effect and it's a permanent part of the geometry. Excuse me again. <coughs> and you could change the color of it, change the surface properties, but you couldn't move it around, could you? I mean, once it's in part of that geometry, what we did the other day, it's part of it. 
This, on the other hand, we can move it around. We can change the size of it. We can move it up, down, round, um, have multiple multiples. You could have multiple stencils projected on there. Works pretty nice. So this will give you more control over your surfaces. The control, the surfaces will be richer. They can be richer, more detailed, look like the actual surface. <coughs> and that's what you're going to have to really look hard at with your toy. Even if it's a simple toy, even if it's just a die or you know, die pair of dice, you know, what parts of it are shiny, what parts <coughs> of it are matte, maybe you can tinker with it. And if it's majority of it is shiny, then maybe you can add something else to your scene that's matte to complement it. Um, all sorts of things that you can do. Um, and I used the example of the beer bottle the other day. There are all kinds of layers of mats that you could make just for the label alone. That parts of the label, if it has, <coughs> there are lots of um, beer labels that have metallic paper on it and it has slightly bumpy or wrinkly kind of surface. Well, you could have that by itself would be quite a few things. Number one, what areas of the label or need to be masked and allow it to have a bumpy surface? What areas of the label need to be masked to allow to be, have a reflective part of it? Because part of the label might not be reflective, it might be matte, part of it might be shiny. Then for the label itself, just like I masked the window, you would want to mask it so that it's projected on the side of the bottle, right? But the rest of the bottle is glass and is transparent. It's the same principle. You're masking part of it and allowing the other part to show through. So no different. That's another good combination, good example. So I'm going to go ahead and send this over to layout, and I hope I haven't screwed things up. We'll see in a minute. Send object to layout. Can't find what can window TGA. Yes, I'll, I'll swap it. That's why surface editors look similar, but they're different, and I find this extremely annoying. While I already found the image, the window TGA for the modeler, as soon as you send the object over to layout, the surface editor that's in layout, while it looks identical, is different. And it's looking for it as well. So now I have to go back to the desktop again. And I'm going to find my window demo folder that I created. And what am I going to do? I'm going to look under images and I'm going to look under Im window. And here's my window TGA. And hopefully it will find most of the rest, but it's not. It's still looking for the River TGA. Remember, I didn't make a copy of that. So I'll try to do that today. Now I need to go back to the hard drive. I need to look in applications. I need to look in, uh, what do I need to look in? I need to look in Lightwave 8. I need to look in content. I need to look in classic content. I need to look in images within classic content. I need to scroll down and find photos. And ta-da, buried we way deep in here is my river. And hopefully that's all of it. <coughs> now, in textured view, you don't see much, do you? Now, I can rotate this around. I don't know whether I'm looking at this from the right view or not. I don't know what's going on here. So what I do is I do a quick render just to make sure that the thing looks right. So let's look from, switch from perspective to camera view because I don't know which, I know it's one of these four sides, but I don't know which one is which. So I'm going to do a quick render here. And, but before I do, let's go to render, let's go to render options, um, make sure image viewer, let's turn Viper on because I want you to see what will be visible and what will not be visible. Let's turn on shadows, transparency, reflectivity, refraction. Now let's render frame and see what we have. That's not right. So let's abort it. Let's put this to the side. Let's hit Y for rotate. Actually, I'm going to undo this. And instead, I'm going to move the camera around. So let's um, 
I'm in camera view. Let's select the camera. Let's go ahead and hit T for move. Let's move it up a little bit. Let's hit Y for rotate. Let's look down on top of it a little bit. Let's hit Y again so that I'm looking at it from an angle. Let's hit T for move. Let's move it around. And there we go. I was looking at the wrong side. Okay. And when you look at it, it doesn't look like much, does it? And of course, when I'm done, if I've screwed up the texture, it still won't look like much. But I'm hopeful that it, it looks the way it's supposed to. And again, this is in textured view. So let's go ahead and bring Viper up. Because remember, in order to use Viper, you need to do a render first. Because if I click render here, it just shows me what I had before. So let's, with this new view, let's render again. Render frame. And voila, it's coming out the way I'd hoped. Let's go ahead and render again. And we're lucky. Just about everything shows up. It doesn't look as good as the final render, though. Now, I have really messed up, and I think I did that when I changed the bump map to turbulence, that this doesn't look right anymore for the window frame. Notice that my light is from a different angle than I had done before and everything. But everything is working. It's transparent. I can see the sphere inside. Notice that the window frame is bumped and it is raised from the surface. Um, the wood is showing around the frame, not over it or anything. So all of the stencils are working correctly. And again, all done with images. Very simple geometry. Just a simple box, but I've created something extremely complicated. And it is complicated, I won't deny that, because there's lots of pieces, lots of parts that have to be layered on top of one another in order for all of this to work. What I will do is I'm going to make this folder available on my public folder. And you should be able to get to it. If not, bring up your flash drive, and I will give you a copy of the folder so that you will have access to these images and to these files. And you can do what I've done to pick it apart and look at how I have used the projections, how I have masked the layers so only certain parts are allowed to be visible and other parts are hidden. But <clears throat> I've done the same demo. For years and years and years, only because I think it, it does a good job in illustrating what I'm trying to do. I think the other one to do would be I should just get a, a beer bottle or something and design a label with crumply surfaces and stuff like that and do one of those too. It would be the same, same deal. Where you can totally control what's transparent, what's opaque, what's bumpy, what's not what's reflective, what's not, parts of images. And again, on this, on this one polygon, I have an image of the window frame projected, and I also have the image of wood projected. I could have other images projected on here. If I wanted a stencil on here, I mean, maybe, some, maybe you wanted to project graffiti on the side of this or something, you know, like spray paint across the whole thing. <coughs> it would be much easier rather than to put this on the entire image, to create a separate image, same size as what we have generated here, of just the graffiti. And then create a stencil so that you can control what, is, what part of that image and how big the graffiti is projected on here and what is not. So you can layer, layer, layer all these different parts onto a single polygon. And that's, I think, that's worth noting, too. All of this is projected onto a single polygon. And it's this sort of thing that I really want you to, not necessarily to this extent, but with your toy, try to project some type or try to project, it could be 
you know, if you were doing a little plastic truck or something and had a, ha a little sticker of a smiley face on it or something like that, that rather than try to build that into the geometry of it, try to actually just make a Photoshop or an Illustrator two-dimensional piece and project it on there. Select the polygons that you want to project it onto. Turn that into a new, sur new surface and make it just a generic color and then create the image in Photoshop or Illustrator and project it onto that. And then decide, looking at it, is this a matte surface? Is this a shiny surface? Is this an opaque surface? Is it a transparent surface? Are there any bumpy qualities to it? You know, any, is it ripply, crinkly? Um, this is a way that you could create, if you wanted with a bump surface, that maybe just the edges looked bumpy. You know, like it's a, old torn paper and a little bit is torn up or bumpy, you know, from water getting underneath or something, that you can do that. No need in changing the geometry. This is what I meant the other day when that friend of mine, Dallas Good, told me, if you can do it with maps, it's much better. It takes less memory, <coughs> okay, so the, the geometry is much simpler. You have much more flexibility when you're done because if I choose to, I could come in here and I could put 10, 10 of those windows on the side and I could put the same 10 windows on all the sides of the box and not change one bit of the geometry of the box. So the initial setup does take a while to build. But when you're done and you have everything working, like I have everything working here, Believe me, <coughs> um, it takes a lot less time, and it is much more forgiving as well because you can go back and change it. If I decide later on I don't want that there anymore, or as I said, I, well, I don't want the wood there anymore, I want a stucco surface or something, it's very easy to change. I can remove that texture, put a bump map in there that has a stucco-y kind of texture like cr crumple or so something, use a procedural, <coughs> and it changes the whole look of it without changing the geometry. Okay, I'll have the video of this available probably by tomorrow morning. Um, I will have, if you want to bring your, your flash drive, I will give you a copy of these files now. And I will also put a copy of it on my public folder so that you can download it as well. You have to be in this room to download it though. So, okay. <coughs> Okie doke, rest of today's work day.